This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We turn now to a Democracy Now! exclusive involving the National Security Agency and Nelson Mandela. Today, one of the leading transparency activists in the United States has turned his attention to one of this country's greatest secrets. Ryan Shapiro has just filed a lawsuit this morning against the NSA, the FBI and the Defense Intelligence Agency in an attempt to force the agencies to release documents about the U.S. role in the 1962 capture and imprisonment of Nelson Mandela, the late South African president and anti-apartheid leader. The United States has never confirmed its involvement, but details have leaked out over the years. In 1990, the Cox News Service quoted a former U.S. official saying within hours after Mandela's arrest, a senior CIA operative named Paul Eckel admitted the agency's involvement. Eckel was reported as having told the official, quote, we have turned Mandela over to the South African security branch. We gave them every detail, what he would be wearing, the time of day, just where he would be. They have picked him up. It is one of our greatest coups, unquote. Several news outlets have reported the actual source of the tip that led to the arrest of Mandela was a CIA official named Donald Rickard. Mandela was held for 27 years after he was captured. Ryan Shapiro already has a pending suit against the CIA over its role in Mandela's capture. And to find out why it took until 2008 for Mandela to be removed from the U.S. terrorist watch list. So far, no government agency has opened its secret records on Mandela. The NSA has already rejected one of Shapiro's requests for its information on Mandela, citing, quote, national security. Over the past decade, Ryan Shapiro has become a leading freedom of information activist, unearthing tens of thousands of once-secret documents. His work focuses on how the government infiltrates and monitors political movements, in particular those for animal and environmental rights. Today, he has around 700 Freedom of Information Act requests before the FBI, seeking around 350,000 documents. <clears throat> that tenacity has led the Justice Department to call him the most prolific requester there is in one year, two per day. <clears throat> It has also led the FBI to dub his academic dissertation a threat to national security. Ryan Shapiro, welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. So let's start with Nelson Mandela. Um, right. Talk about why you have applied for this information. Sure. So I'm pursuing these records mostly because I'm interested in knowing why the U.S. intelligence community viewed Mandela as a threat to American security. and what role the U.S. intelligence community played in thwarting Mandela's struggle for racial justice and democracy in South Africa. As you said, I'm especially interested in records pertaining to the U.S. intelligence community's role in Mandela's 1962 arrest and Mandela's placement on the U.S. terror watch list until 2008, which was years after he had won not only the Nobel Peace Prize, but the U.S. Congressional um, Gold Medal and U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom. Not to mention. <clears throat> He was the president of South Africa. Yes, yes. So all through that period, he was considered a terrorist by the United States. Yes, he was. I want to turn to journalist Andrew Coburn, who first reported on the CIA link to Nelson Mandela's arrest in 1986 in The New York Times. He's now the Washington editor for Harper's Magazine. We interviewed him in December, and I asked him to talk about what he had found out in the mid-'80s. At this point, Nelson Mandela had been imprisoned for over 20 years. He'd been. I found out, or I reported that he'd been, as you mentioned, that he'd been arrested uh, thanks to a tip from the CIA um, while disguised as a chauffeur. He was actually. What I'd heard at the time was he was actually on his way to meet uh, an undercover CIA, an American diplomat who was actually a CIA official. Um, so it made it rather easy for them to uh, to alert the South Africans where to find him. Um, I mentioned I thought it was particularly interesting to report uh, when I did in 1986, because at that point it was just when um, the sanctions were being introduced over, uh, been voted through by the Congress over uh, President Reagan's veto. So, um, and I'd noticed that in the um, sanctions legislation, it said there should be no contact, with official contact with the South African military, uh, and so on and so forth, except when. 
intelligence required that, you know, they did have to have contact. So it was ongoing, this unholy relationship, which had led to Mandela being arrested and locked up for all those years, uh, continued on through the 60s, through the 70s, through the 80s. Um, absolutely flourished with the, for example, the NSA routinely handing over uh, intercepts of the ANC to the South African uh, secret police. U.S. military intelligence cooperated very closely with South African military intelligence, giving them information about what was going on, what they were collecting in the rest of Southern Africa. And in fact, you know, the two countries, um, the CIA uh, and the South Africans, collaborated on, you know, assisting the uh, UNITA in the horrible civil war in Angola that went on for years and years, with thousands of people dying. So. You know, this wasn't just a flash in the pan, the uh, tip-off that led to the, uh, uh, you know, the coordination on the arrest of Mandela. It was absolutely a very deep, uh, very thorough relationship that went on for decades. That was journalist Andrew Coburn. I now want to read from the letter the NSA sent to Ryan Shapiro in response to his Freedom of Information Act request for records on Nelson Mandela. The letter is dated December 31, 2013, just a few months ago. It reads, in part, <clears throat> to the extent that you're seeking intelligence information on Nelson Mandela, we have determined that the fact of the existence or non-existence of the materials you request is currently improperly classified matter. The letter continues, quote, the FOIA does not apply to, mem to matters that are specifically authorized under criteria established by an executive order to be kept secret in the interest of national defense or foreign relations, end quote. And it cites another statute, Title 18, U.S. Code 798. Ryan Shapiro, explain. Well, that next code is the, the Espionage Act of 1917. And as you've discussed many times in this show, this is the same odious law under which Chelsea Manning was convicted, um, Edward Snowden is facing charges, and Daniel Ellsberg was prosecuted um, for leaking the Pentagon Papers. So how do you get around uh, the fact that you've been denied? Today, as uh, we go to air, you filed this uh, new FOIA with NSA. What changed in your request? Well, today I filed a lawsuit uh, against the NSA, FBI, DIA, and CIA uh, due to their failure to comply with the Freedom of Information Act. They're, they are in violation of federal law, uh, and so I, I'm suing them to, to hold them accountable to federal law. Uh, what, what changed is that they failed to comply with law, and so I'm suing them to hold them accountable. How do we get around it? That's a very, that's a great question and a very tough one. Um, the NSA is a very difficult nut to crack as far as FOIA is concerned. Not only does the NSA invoke national defense here, as well as the Espionage Act, they also invoke the, the NSA Act of 1959, which, though the NSA Act of 1959 was passed years before the Freedom of Information Act was passed, the NSA has succeeded in convincing the courts that the NSA Act of 1959 exempts the NSA entirely from the obligations of FOIA. And so, the only times the NSA complies with the Freedom of Information Act is when it wants to, which is when the release of records will make the NSA uh, look good, and it should therefore be unsurprising that uh, the recent AP report found that the NSA uh, failed to comply with the N or denied FOIA requests 98 percent of the time last year. How are they in violation of the law? Well, my um, my FOIA attorney Jeffrey Light, who is a DC-based FOIA specialist. Um, will um, be arguing in part that Exemption 3 does not apply here, that, in fact, the NSA is wrong in arguing that the NSA Act exempts uh, the agency entirely from FOIA. The NSA also failed to conduct an adequate search for records responsive to my request. And perhaps most basically, they're not, they're not refusing to release records. They're saying that it would violate national security to even confirm or deny the existence of records. And whether or not the release of records might violate national security, uh, my attorney and I intend to argue that simply confirming the existence or denying the existence of the records uh, is would certainly be within the bounds of the Freedom of Information Act. I wanted to turn to President Obama. Um, following Nelson Mandela's uh, uh, death last year. President Obama referenced Mandela's time in jail during his speech at the memorial. He would endure a brutal 
imprisonment that began in the time of Kennedy and Khrushchev and reached the final days of the Cold War. Emerging from prison without the force of arms, he would, like Abraham Lincoln, hold his country together when it threatened to break apart. While Obama referenced the Kennedy administration in his memorial, he'd made no mention of the multiple reports that the CIA under Kennedy tipped off the apartheid South African regime in 1962 about Mandela's whereabouts. Now I want to go fast forward to 1990. Uh, Nelson Mandela had been released from jail. Four months after his release, Nelson Mandela traveled to the United States. <clears throat> He spoke at Yankee Stadium, where he was introduced by Harry Belafonte. Never in the history of humankind has there ever been a voice that has more clearly caught the imagination and the spirit and fired the hope for freedom than the voice of the Deputy President of South Africa, Nelson Mandela. The principle of one person, one vote on a common and non-racial voters role is therefore our central strategic objective. Throughout our lifetime, we have fought against white domination and have fought against black domination. We intend to remain true to this principle to the end of our days. That was Nelson Mandela, the former president of South Africa, speaking at Yankee Stadium four months after his release from prison in South Africa. He came to the United States to thank those who had fought for his freedom. That clip is taken from Danny Schechter's film Mandela in America, Ryan Shapiro. Um, we're going to move on in our next segment to talk about other cases you are involved with. But why is this so important to you? And also talk about the latest news we have of President Obama um, seeking limits for the NSA. Why is this so important to me? I want to know why. Nelson Mandela is now almost universally hailed as a tremendous freedom fighter, uh, 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 this heroic figure, and yet the United States actively suppressed his movement, uh, was very likely involved in putting him in prison for decades. and and supported both uh, covertly and openly the apartheid state in, in, until near its end. Why? And the answer has to do with this blinkered understanding of national security, this myopic understanding that places crass uh, military um, alliances and corporate profits over human rights and, and civil liberties. And I'm interested in I'm interested in highlighting how we as a nation need to foster a broader understanding of national security. And I think by trying to get records on why Nelson Mandela was on the U.S. terror watch list until 2008 is, is a good opportunity to do that. And President Obama today announcing changing rules, not that those rules will affect your lawsuit? That's right. Those rules will not affect uh, my lawsuit. Uh, Obama's proposal offers some improvements, although only about one surveillance program and only um, limited portions thereof. But, but even more problematically, Obama's proposal offers no mechanism for transparency or, or serious oversight. Remember that the only reason we know about this program to begin with is the Snowden revelations and that the director of national intelligence even lied to Congress about it. And now Obama is offering or proposing a few changes and then asking us to trust the same people who have been spying on us and lying to us in the first place. And we're still left with a secret spy agency operating secret surveillance programs, uh, obtaining secret permission from secret courts, um, there's just no mechanism for transparency. Indeed, as I was just saying, the NSA believes it's entirely exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. There's just no transparency. How can we trust an agency we aren't allowed to know anything about, especially an agency with this sort of track record? Has the NSA ever been successfully sued? I am unaware of any successful lawsuits against uh, the NSA, um, any FOIA lawsuits against the NSA. I 
don't know that there are none, but I am not aware of any. Very few have tried. Ryan Shapiro, we're going to continue with you after break, talk about um, uh, other issues that you've been involved with, trying to get information from the U.S. government. Ryan Shapiro has been called a FOIA superhero for his skill at obtaining government records using the Freedom of Information Act. We'll see if he will be successful in his lawsuit against the U.S. government, the NSA, the FBI, the DIA, in getting documents um, around the imprisonment of Nelson Mandela. Again, the NSA letter that I uh, just read said, <clears throat> though it wouldn't confirm the existence or non-existence of the materials, that they are currently and properly classified matter. This is Democracy Now! Back with Ryan Shapiro in a minute. 